Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag CyberSound. The cloud has changed the way we do business and the way we develop and deploy software and infrastructure. What are the security benefits of moving to cloud and what are the special concerns? What should companies do to ensure the cloud stays secure? Joining us today in conversation about cloud security are Laura Kankala and Antti Vähäsipilä of F-Secure. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello, nice to be here. Oh, thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. So what is your relationship with the cloud? Well, <laughs> my relationship with the cloud is quite a long one, I would say. I have done some developmental work on the cloud, like uh, mostly on AWS, but it's like uh, ever since I first stumbled upon AWS, I was kind of, it just changed the way I saw how things can be done and how like infrastructure can be built. So I was very intrigued. And also like security wise, I've been working a lot with my clients and try to help them with their issues and with their worries regarding the cloud. So I do a lot of assessments and uh, auditing uh, regarding cloud infrastructure. I, I think that my relationship is mostly being a paying customer for cloud services. <laughs> But on the other hand, I uh, personally, I do a lot of work with uh, software security uh, processes, DevOps and all that stuff. And now like with DevOps essentially, uh, especially there, I've got... Um, A feeling that without modern cloud services, you wouldn't be able to do much of anything. Mm. And uh, I'm really interested in getting security in there as well. Yeah. Before we go further, let's talk about what the cloud essentially is. So everyone's talking about it, but it's not like any one specific thing. What would be a constructive way to approach what the cloud is? Well, I would say that Uh, maybe it's easiest to compare it to a, tra- a traditional data center model. So you have a traditional data center somewhere sitting and you'll typically have some contact people there. You have to contact them like, hey, please do this and this change to the firewall setting. Or, you know, it's uh, you have this very strongly integrated uh, infrastructure team that it's ha- is handling your infra. But with the cloud, you can actually be your own infra team. So you can have your uh, DevOps people, you can have your developers doing the infrastructure around your uh, systems. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's that's ma- probably the main uh, aspect of the cloud that you don't have to touch the very underlying infra unless you really want to. Yeah. But then again, there's um, a thing called a split responsibility model. Mm. with most cloud providers. So they clearly designate which part of the infra they are handling and the rest, rest is uh, left to you. Now this uh, split is obviously, it can be on different layers. Yeah, I would say, I don't know if you agree with me, but the rough uh, like split responsibility model is that whatever you do in the cloud, that is your problem and that is for you to secure but everything that you can touch so the data centers and the hardware mm. that is not your problem so to say so you are not responsible for those but we heard of different kind of service models like you got infrastructure as a service platform as a service and finally software as a service is that the cloud or is that something else well it depends on your needs i mean if you if you just require software that you're using then you're buying SaaS, but from the perspective of the user, it really doesn't make any difference if your SaaS is running like on premises in your data center or in a public cloud, right? Right. So you'll you'll get the same type of software anyway. Uh, so you can get a kind of cloud, depending on the layer that you're talking about, you can get a cloud-like service even if you have your own data centers. Yeah. And it's also a lot about the... Uh, scalability of the applications maybe like we're talking about this split responsibility model but i think what really makes a cloud service a cloud service is also that they are very scalable and you can have this uh, you can have application and and in case you don't need a lot of capacity at some point and suddenly you have uh, you have an online store and suddenly you need a lot of more capacity to actually run the store, then you can quickly scale up your resor- resources without having your web application crashing down. Yeah, exactly. So if you if you if you just want to uh, 
like use software as a service um, and the uh, load on your service is usually pretty stable, then you might not actually benefit from the cloud at all, in a sense, mm. apart from getting rid of the servers. But then if you want to be elastic, like mm. Trump yeah. goes, <laughs> and you want to scale workloads up and down, uh, then of course you will run out of screwdrivers at some point and servers that you can <laughs> screw into your racks if you, if you own, own your own hardware. But typically, uh, public cloud providers don't run out of hardware. I, I think that's happened, though. I don't know. I'm not sure. Has yeah, it well, happened? Yeah, I heard a story, but we're not going to blame anybody now. Yeah, no, <laughs> right. yeah, let, let's not go there. That's cloud is enough. good. <laughs> so, but what are the most obvious security differences between cloud providers versus like traditional data center mode of operation? Well, I would say that it comes with the shared responsibility model and maybe uh, the way that the developers actually have more control over the infra infrastructure so they can actually implement more security controls like it, it of course depends on what kind of agreements you used to have with the traditional data center and and you know but what kind of controls are we talking about uh well the controls that i'm talking about that you can actually implement the security more uh like it, it can be part of your whole pipeline when you build the code you can have these uh, ma- many of these cloud services they offer services to actually enforce security uh, requirements or compliance requirements in the environment so you have better options to actually monitor the environment and actually like make this uh, security part of the not just an add-on after you've uh, deployed your code but as like a integral part of the whole life cycle in in addition to that i mean when you're actually deploying stuff if you can do it automatically there's uh the option of not putting the human into the loop that much yeah. which makes it even more secure because you don't have to go and click on different consoles and mm-hmm. work on cli that much so you can lock down the deployment yeah that's true you don't have to expose that much that much surface to the internet so you mm-hmm. can have this like no one is gonna ssh into the servers and this is actually I, i think that this is important to understand that it's not necessarily a public cloud uh, mm-hmm. that can provide this mm-hmm. so most of this uh, locking down deployment and uh, handling the security automatically can be done on an on-premises cloud as well it's mm-hmm. it's the same software stack that can be run Mm. Uh, whether or not the servers are owned by you or the public cloud provider. You guys were talking about sharing the responsibility between the cloud providers and cloud customers. So what are the responsibilities of each group in keeping your data secure? I think it's, to put it really bluntly, uh, um, the cloud provider uh, is responsible for the service and the customer is responsible for the configuration of the service. Mm. And this is then replayed on every layer so if it's infra the it's the net uh, the raw networking that the cloud provider needs to mm-hmm. take care of and then the customer needs to look at the configuration of the network including like opening ports and what what have you mm. so this is like the old uh, infrastructure as a service model so here's your here's your bare metal don't hurt yourself Yeah, yeah, and then on a higher layer, higher layer. So, for example, if you've got a some sort of a platform as a service, like a managed Kubernetes or something like that, then, then yes, you'll have the Kubernetes that's hopefully secure. Uh, but how you actually deploy your workloads on that then is mm. your problem. Yeah. Yeah. So if you leave your S3 buckets wide open, that's on you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or if you. Uh, If you decide to run a vulnerable application on Kubernetes, then yeah. not, nothing, nothing in the provider's Kubernetes is going to help you. Yeah, so like a good distinction here is that nothing is inherently secure in the cloud or in the traditional data centers unless you test it out, you know that your code is good, you know that you are not exposing too much attack surface. For example, with the uh, S3 buckets being open in the to the internet, So that's on you and you have to test it and you have to be aware of how you actually build stuff there. Cloud, the cloud is not secure per se, but it's not like super unsecure either. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think it's probably in many cases actually more secure than anything you could whip up yourself unless you have the means. I mean, uh, the big cloud providers, they, they have... Uh, clients that have really really strict security requirements mm. uh, even 
like national uh, something that requires national clearance of, yeah. of sorts and uh, yeah and people who manage these kind of things every day all day yeah exactly and now they're not going to weaken the security just for you because you are an individual but mm-hmm. you'll actually be standing on the shoulders of giants so to speak so you will benefit from all the stuff that was done for those really uh, security conscious customers Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, it's a good thing to point out that many of these, for example, AWS, Azure, uh, and like these major cloud providers, they have many compliance, like they they meet many compliance requirements. So somebody has at least looked under the ho- under the hood and said that okay, it appears to be okay, and it appears to be but secure. On, yeah, but on the other hand, that's the only thing that you can do if you want to look under the hood. So if you really have some really esoteric security needs you're only going to have a like a white paper mm. um, or a bunch of pdfs written by an audit company yeah and that's then you have to point. trust yeah. that you yeah. cannot go and see for yourself mm. but arguably in most cases even if you went to see for yourself into a data center you wouldn't be able to tell yeah so like here's the machines and yeah, yeah. they're turned on hopefully yes. and <laughs> light blinks everything's secure <coughs> So you guys did touch upon this, but like, what are the specific security benefits and advantages of going to the cloud? I think there are multiple benefits when you go to the cloud and when you deploy your software in the cloud. For example, the services you can use to monitor compliance and monitor the secu- uh, security status of your uh, configurations on the on that account. For example, in AWS, you have a config to monitor monitor the Uh, how your AWS account is configured. You have so many different options for logging and for seeing if if things are working as intended. And I think that's very good when you, especially if you need to be very conscious of what is happening in your environment and you are handling, for example, very sensitive data in there, like personally identifiable, identifiable data, for example, you have so many options for providing an audit trail that could have been hard to implement in this like traditional data center model that you would have to buy new equipment or you would have to buy new applications to actually see or get that visibility in that kind of environment. So what about the concerns, the risks or threats associated with the cloud? Well, again, I mean, you're using a service. Um, If you configure it in a wrong way, Uh, that's a risk, so you really have to know how uh, w- w- how the service laid out and w- which are the configuration options you have to apply. That's the, not specific to the cloud. That's always been the case. Uh, that's true in a way, yes. But uh, the cloud gives you tools that you may not have seen before. I, I it's uh, especially like looking at the uh, new releases from the public cloud providers. What sort of services they offer. Uh, it would probably be a full-time job just to keep on top of these things that they actually come out with. And in order to be actually fluent in all the security configurations of all of these, would probably need a couple of people full-time. So just seeing all those cool things lying around, there's a temptation to pick one up before you're sort of ready to actually do something smart with it. Yeah, there's this like shining plus two mace that's lying on the ground and you really want to pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that analogy. <laughs> so let's say your company does choose a cloud provider. Uh, Laura, you were recommending doing penetration testing anyway to, to further assess the security of your data. How does that even work? Like given that you're pen testing what's essentially someone else's computer and the environment is shared with other customers as well. Yeah. I mean you're not pen testing like AWS or Azure per se, you're pen testing your own applications. And uh, when it comes to cloud providers, they have different processes around this. So you, with AWS, you have to apply for this, like I'm gonna conduct a penetration test on my application so they know that you're gonna do this. Because I think this this is true with just like traditional software. You have to test it, you have to know how secure it is and There's no escaping that no matter where you're hosting your services. So basically this comes down to the so division of responsibilities. You're pen testing the part you're responsible for, but you can't touch the the parts that the cloud provider is re- responsible for. You just have to take them by faith, as you said. Yeah, well, yes, you you 
have a look at the PDF provided to you by an audit company and then you decide that, yes, I, I trust this. So how aware are companies about the ramifications of sharing this uh, security responsibility with the cloud provider? Well, many companies probably might not actively realize that uh, the same pattern actually turns up in software development where they're using a lot of third-party dependencies. They are just uh, essentially blindly uh, trusting that all the software they're like pulling into their own product does what it says on the tin. It's open source. I'm sure somebody's taken a look at it <laughs> at some point. Yes. In most cases, somebody has, but yeah. whether or not somebody's changed that source code afterwards mm. is then another thing. Or just so, written an exploit. <laughs> some uh, way yeah. to pull request and <laughs> yeah. nobody merged it. So, yeah. Although I have a feeling that almost all the firms that are like kind of cloud native or start doing, uh, start using cloud services uh, from the beginning, they are very, very aware of these things. And uh, I, I think I think that public cloud providers are doing an excellent job in actually educating people about the responsibility split and all this stuff. So it's, yeah. I don't think it's that rare anymore that people would be completely in, in the dark. Yeah. So we're not seeing like a lot of traditional companies that are sort of moving to the cloud and now they're there's this firm belief that like it's in the cloud it's like somebody else has taken care of it i don't have to worry about things so much anymore i think that for many companies who are doing the leap in the cloud it's actually the other way around so they're afraid that now they don't have any more control mm. uh, like people are still a little bit hesitant they're not like sure like okay some big companies now in possession of my data and I have to trust them with everything, which is weird also, I think, because you can always encrypt your data even when you're storing it in AWS. And you can also be in possession of the encryption keys. So in that sense, you can have also this, hopefully maybe the uh, ease of mind that, okay, I am truly in control of my data. It of course comes down to trust every time. So you have to also trust the providers you're using, whether they are cloud or traditional data center. But is that trust well-founded? Like what we say are the most common reasons that cloud security breaches happen and are those breaches, are the problems typically in the responsibility of the cloud provider or the customer? To my knowledge, I have not heard of anyone breaching, for example, AWS or Azure data center and, you know, like gone there and actually from that hardware gotten any data out. So when the breaches happen, I would say it's a human er error or it's a misconfiguration in that uh, specific cloud provider, like the way you built your application or just, you know, regular, just vulnerability in your application that somebody exploits. So, and in that case, it's kind of the company's fault who built that software in there. So we're not seeing a lot of mistakes made by the cloud providers? Well, would they tell us even if they had any breaches? Would they be able to hide some, like if there, if there was like a epidemic problem in the security of a, of a cloud platform, like wouldn't that be discernible to someone? This is one of the uh, key problems that we have in the risk analysis for uh, information security, that th there's not enough data to go around that you could actually do like any sort of statistics, for example, that how probable it is that I'm going to get hacked or yeah. something like that. Uh, companies don't willingly disclose information. Uh, there are some regulation now in place that tries to force you to disclose that but even all that information doesn't end up in public domain. It might only be reported to the authorities. How have cloud services changed the way we develop software and deploy infrastructure? Yeah, that's a big, big, big and very good question. I think it's having a tremendous effect right now. So what we, we are hearing about is a trend or a buzzword called cloud native, cloud native architects or cloud native computing that uh, utilizes the... Uh, aspects of the cloud to make it easier for um, development teams to do operations as well. Yeah, I mean, it it does change also the roles of people. So maybe at some point we don't actually need this kind of like 
when you think of sysadmin just sitting on the uh, servers and doing configurations there, you can actually have your whole infrastructure as code so you can deploy your infra from your code. Yeah, so what that means really is that you have a text file that describes what your cloud infrastructure is looking like and then some robot automation comes, picks up the text file and then makes sure it looks like that. Mm. And if there's a change, it will then implement that change for you. Yeah. So, you so basically you saying this is what it looks like makes it so. Exactly. Yeah. That's magic. And and it's really, I think it's very beautiful because then you know exactly what you're deploying, you know exactly what's going on. And that's the beauty of cloud and that's the beauty mm. of automation. And not only that, but you can actually build your own tests around it. So you can actually, well, test for one, the functionality of your software, but also if you want to take that a step further, you can also apply uh, security testing in that as well. So it's very, I think it's very beautiful. Mm. And uh, now that we have uh, even more plumbing in the in the cloud on the like a platform as a service, so to speak, service meshes and everything, you can actually describe very intricate network layer configurations, for example, in those files, and then just get it applied um, stuff that would be a nightmare to maintain manually. Like you said, cloud nativity is a buzzword you hear thrown around a lot. Um, for the purposes of co this conversation, when we're saying the cloud, sort of we're talking about applications that have been developed to be cloud native from the word go. Is that what cloud nativity means? Well, I, I've read at least three different definitions, like uh, semi-formal <laughs> definitions of what cloud native mm -hmm. means. But in a sense, it means that you have your applications or workloads that you want to run. You package them in boxes called containers with all the dependencies that they need to run. And then you have some sort of an orchestration system that you run them in. Uh, and that's the platform as a service, typically. Mm. Uh, and uh, that gives you a lot of security benefits already at this stage, even if you wouldn't go into the actual architecture of how your application is laid out. So what kind of benefits? What, kind of, what are the implications of, of this kind of approach? Well, for one, uh, the benefits are that you can have these uh, you, your services, they don't have to be like, this huge, big uh, system. You can have these small services, like microservices, for example, that you have easier uh, time to manage. You can have easier time to deploy them. You have easier time for scaling them up and down. So depending on your needs. So uh, if your uh, online store suddenly gets a uh, tons of visitors, you can just scale up the amount of containers you're running and then suddenly you're able to actually handle all those customers instead of the uh, web shop just shutting down under the load. So that is like the av availability benefit at least. And uh, when you talk about containers, for example, if you're doing it right and, and you are in control the, of the images that you use for deploying these containers, I believe you can make quite secure solutions because you can so isolate these services also like on these, uh, you don't have to run each service, uh, like every service on the same server. So if one of those services gets, somebody finds a vulnerability in, in it and can run their code through it or somehow exploit it, they, their impact is can be limited to only that one service and that one container. Microservice architecture is one of the building blocks that's usually mentioned in conjunction with cloud native. And for data breach avoidance, that's actually a really interesting pattern because you will uh, require all your users to go through a very well specified API that's hopefully very robust and tested. And each microservice will all also own their own data and they won't offer any sort of like backdoor access to the mm -hmm. databases, for example, that somebody could use to dump the dump the stuff. So they would have to do that through the API. Yeah. So if you have like this sort of a chain of microservices, uh, one service calling another one, and it, when you even lock down the network connections between those, you are ending up with a pretty robust basic architecture. Yeah. And that's one of the key things there. Yeah. What about the sort of dynamic web between all these uh, microservices and and things? You can so you're sort of creating this moving 
uh, entity, this uh, this uh, Hogwarts staircase that's always in motion? <laughs> Does that make it harder for the attackers to sort of figure out what's going on and, and where to go, things like that? Well, I think, for one, if you're running containers and your applications are in containers, the... Um, the life cycle of container may not be that long and even you you may not even use a container you may use a, for example in AWS a lambda or azure you may use a azure function to have these serverless functions that operate as your api or they do calls in the back end so there's actually not that much to exploit when you don't have this it's it's just alive for that amount of time that you call the function or the lambda and unless you specify that this will stay alive for a longer period of time. So there's not much, you know, to attack there in the end. Well, at least the attacks have to happen immediately. Yeah. I mean, uh, you cannot just like uh, um, put up house in so- on somebody's server because the server is going away very soon. Yeah. yeah but well, but it doesn't true. necessarily do much for like a, a traditional SQL injection. You can, if, if you're vulnerable for that, it doesn't really help if, yeah. if you have a kind of a ephemeral node. Mm. Yeah, whenever you spin that up, you're still going to have the vulnerability. Exactly, and you can just exploit it in a second. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and when it comes to lambdas, well, I personally have done some like research and stuff like that with them. So, of course, there are ways of exploiting stuff if you are running vulnerable code as lambda. Like, naturally, there are ways of... Uh, gaining persistence for at least for a short a short amount of time but it's still quite hypothetical in most cases and if you do assessment for your code that you run as a lambda or as a function uh, then i think they're quite quite secure but now that developers are running continuous integration in this cloud native uh, thingamajigs is that m- Does that mean that the sort of gap between security person and developer is growing narrower and narrower? Well, I I think it should, uh, meaning that um, at some point the uh, developers who now can do some sort of operations as well will also be able to do some sort of security operations. But then again, uh, when you get to the point where uh, you have a creative attacker that's looking at you, then you got to be a creative defender as well, and you you don't necessarily you can make, you can create a robust service, but in order to foresee all sorts of different risks, it would help if you had some background in security, uh, because then you would be able to do creative risk assessment essentially. But there's no reason why developers couldn't do that. So I think that what we're going to see is security work very much transferring to the on the, on the desk of the developers. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing as well because the developers know what they're doing. They know their code inside and out. So when the role of security and developer, like the uh, space between them grows narrower, narrower, it just it makes the applications even more secure because then the developers have full understanding like, okay, this is the implication if I'm going to use this vulnerable uh, or this old NPM module or something like that. So in the future, like even those developers who so far have been able to sort of hide behind uh, the security department and sort of externalize the the security to somebody else, they're going to be less able to do so and, and will have to take a more of a security point themselves. Or if you want to put it in another, uh, if you want to twist that around, it might also be that the security departments have to give developers the empowerment to do security. Uh, in my like uh, in my experience, most engineers, most developers actually want to do things properly. They want to do security. They just need time to do that, and uh, this time and empowerment has been taken away from them to a like an external party. Yeah, and then they have like they still have to do the coding and they have to do the developing of the software, but they are not given any extra time to actually mm. Im- implement the security features as well. What is the main takeaway security advice you have for companies using cloud services? Use it. <laughs> no, I mean <clears throat> I encourage uh, using cloud especially if you need <laughs> scalable uh, architecture and if you just want to do 
things in an agile manner i would say like there is no reason why not unless there are some like compliance reasons or something like that but there are so many ways of enforcing security in cloud like through the services and through running your infra as as code and everything so i think that is the future and that is the future maybe for everyone or almost yeah. everyone <laughs> and i'd say if you, if you are a type of company who makes software that's going to run on a server somewhere i mean there's a lot of other types of software as well uh if, if you start new projects try to architect them so that you could theoretically uh, deploy them on a public cloud you don't have to but then you have the option yeah. you can still run all that stuff in-house if you want yeah and you can use the same automation tools yes. for that as well yes that makes sense to me thank you guys for joining us thank you thank you it's nice If you want to hear more about Laura's thoughts on security issues, check out her podcast, We Need to Talk About InfoSec. Antti you can find on Twitter as at AntiVS. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSound. Thanks for listening.